So today we have a really special founder, um, our CEO of Rev1 Ventures, Tom Walker, and um, he's really spent his career building entrepreneurial ecosystems in other states as well as in the UK, and really focused on bringing together the assets and the capital in a region to help foster entrepreneurial success. He's invested in north of 350 companies, um, has also watched a lot of those companies succeed to the tune of about 1.5 billion in successful exits. And so today you're gonna get to hear him talk about the work um, in building Columbus's entrepreneurial ecosystem. So with that, I will hand it over to Tom Walker. Thank you. Well, I've already broke the uh, device here. Okay, thank you, Christy. And, and uh, thank all of you for, for coming here today. I know it was the piata that brought you out. And that's part of the, the design of these. It's, you know, what food are we going to bring to attract a, a crowd? For the record, I wasn't really uh, for this session. Um, I, I, at first, I really didn't uh, think it was appropriate for me to, to come up here and, and share a founder story. But the more the team uh, talked to me about uh, you know, where Rev1 is and, and that we haven't, haven't really told the story of how we got to where we are today and some of our future plans and sort of our perspective on where the Columbus startup community is. Um, they convinced me that this was, a, this was a good opportunity. So I see a lot of friends in the audience and, and I'm really glad to see you. This will be informal, I have a few slides. Those of you that know me, uh, you know I like to have a deck. Um, but we'll, we'll get to Q&A here and I hope that this will be very interactive. First of all, how many of you were at Venture Ohio uh, dinner last night? That was just a terrific event and I think uh, if you were there you recognized um, just how vibrant the Ohio uh, ecosystem is for startups, but in particular Columbus. You know, so w we are biased here at Rev1. We're, we're about Central Ohio, and I thought last night was really terrific. There were venture investors that traveled to our state um, from all over the country and even uh, internationally to, to go to that event. So if you didn't make this year's, put it on your calendar for next year. We, ho we hope you can be there. So. Um, Christy, thank you for that introduction, and um, so a little bit about the Rev1 story and Columbus uh, uh, startups, uh, really Rev1 style is what we want to talk about. So we view ourselves as about three and a half years old or so. Um, I've been here five years. Um, I was recruited by the board of Tech Columbus and uh, several community leaders to explore a new model for um, uh, enhancing the startup ecosystem here in Columbus. And um, I moved here from Oklahoma where I was um, in a, a similar role for uh, roughly 14 years. I was co-founder of a company there called I2E and um, was only gonna be there for two years and you know, 14 years later I, I was still there. And Columbus uh, really looked like an exciting opportunity. Um, when I was first invited to come to town, I was met uh, by six CEOs of some of the largest companies in town, and, uh, which was fascinating to me, that they were interested in the startup ecosystem. And um, that really began to outline an opportunity. I, I thought that this uh, was really an exciting endeavor. And the opportunity is that there has uh, been very committed regional leadership in, in our community, in, in our region, from at the city level, um, at the state level, and at the corporate level. Really prominent research institutions, depending on how you add it up, every year there's roughly $6 billion spent on R&D in the city limits of Columbus. And so what a phenomenal opportunity if you can really start to tap into the uh, that intellectual property and intellectual knowledge that, that creates those kinds of commercial opportunities. Large corporate base, very successful corporate base here in the Columbus region, as well as a very diverse corporate base. So what kind of opportunities might that create for, for uh, startups? Um, terrific state support. In fact, the state program through the Ohio Third Frontier that supports a lot of the startup ecosystem uh, work throughout Ohio is the envy of just about every other state in the United States. And um, so, you know, that was also uh, something pretty interesting. A lot of first-time entrepreneurs in our region. So, you start 
clicking through all these assets and you think, okay, a lot of first time entrepreneurs, not a lot of entrepreneurs that have been through exits, few companies funded, uh, not a lot of history of venture capital in our region. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, you know, some, some funds that have been here for a while like NCT Ventures, but you know, not a lot of support for them outside of the, the work that, that, that they're doing. And not a lot of companies growing. Um, and while there was a lot of corporate interest, there was low corporate engagement in the startup community, almost to the tune of none. Um, there was just almost hardly any. So um, as this uh, opportunity sort of evolved, um, I became uh, engaged and really we formed a partnership with Columbus 2020. How many of you are aware of Columbus 2020? A, a very vital organization in town, partnered with the Columbus Partnership. They had developed a very comprehensive economic development strategy for Central Ohio. And ultimately, Rev1 became part of that strategy. We're the create part of that strategy. So where 2020 is um, the recruitment and retention of larger corporations, Rev1 really plays an integral ro uh, role in the creation of, of new startups. That's unique. Not many cities in the United States have a comprehensive strategy that, that thinks about starting new companies, retaining and growing large companies, and recruiting large companies. So um, again, another great, great opportunity for us. So for us, central to our mission as we started you know, navigating the path from Tech Columbus to a new company that became Rev1 Ventures, it was really how do we connect all of these assets then that are in our backyard because um, we have tremendous assets and things that I haven't mentioned such as very low unemployment, um, you know, one of the fastest growing uh, regions in, in the Midwest, in the country. We're also among the top ten in um, young professionals moving to the area. So you start adding up all of these assets, how can we connect that? So it becomes more about how do we refocus our regional efforts around the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial needs. And then for us, we had to build a team. How, how do you then build a team around these opportunities to, the, to then um, find the best and brightest um, opportunities, help them start, and then help them grow? And where we are today, um, we have roughly, uh, how many employees do we have? 30, 34, 34-ish? If I've missed somebody, if there's a 35th out there, I apologize. So we're 34 employees. Um, just about everybody is, is new on the team since roughly 2013. And um, you know, some uh, last hires in, in uh, actually this year. Um, we've built very deep um, technical expertise. So we have a bench uh, focused specifically on life sciences. We have a bench specifically focused on software IT, data analytics. And we have a bench specifically focused on um, hard sciences, so uh, advanced materials, things of that nature. And those are, in, in broad scope, the kinds of industries that we see entrepreneurs uh, creating businesses around here, every, year in, year out, in, in the Columbus region. We also uh, began to focus on engaging the, the corporate uh, base. So we now have close to 40, 45 corporate partners who are engaged at very, uh, varying degrees, but in very tactical ways to help us uh, deliver services to the startups. Um, in, in some cases, we have corporates who are part of a, a customer acquisition program. So if you're a startup in, in Columbus in our portfolio, we can most likely help you get among your first customers. That's one example. We, we're able to um, grow talent. We're able to um, do a number of things that really um, tie back to our corporate base. We also had this space. Um, how many of you knew this space when it was the Business Technology Center, the BTC? Handful of you. I, I think this is actually one of the uh, longest standing entrepreneur support initiatives in, in Columbus. Um, there's been an incubator program since the late 80s. Uh, BTC started in the 90s, I think. I, I don't I know all of the history. In fact, we've looked for the records. They were sort of hard to find. but. Then they rolled into this facility in the early 2000s. Um, combination of the university, the state, and the community came together to 
rebuild this facility. It was a Siemens manufacturing warehouse. And they turned it into a traditional incubator. And um, on my first trip to Columbus, uh, the, the recruitment team organized a, a networking event with entrepreneurs. I'll, I'll never forget that night. And um, uh, this building was an unbelievable hot button among every entrepreneur that was at that networking event that night and in a, in a very negative light. Um, I'll never forget one of the entrepreneurs telling me that this is the place that entrepreneurs and companies go to die. That's a quote, end quote. And I thought, oh boy, uh, you know, what am I getting into? And in fact, this building was scary to me. I thought, what, what in the world are we going to do with, with that facility? Um, over half of the uh, tenants in the building had been here 10 or, 10 or more years. Um, so as an incubator goes, they were pretty well incubated. So there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a lot of work to be done in this facility. And so we began to view it as a tool. You know? So if you think about a toolbox and the, and the things that you can put together to help entrepreneurs build a great company, we started thinking of this much more as a tool, not an incubator, um, more of an innovation center. And so how could we create a facility that was very vibrant, um, was laid out and, and had amenities in a way that caused collisions of, of uh, different uh, uh, minds, you know? So on one side of the building, those of you who are familiar with it, we have wet labs, some um, 19 wet labs. So traditionally life science, advanced material companies. And mixed throughout, we have software IT and other types of technology companies. So what kind of c collisions can happen among individuals to make this a very collaborative environment? And plus, how can we churn it? How can we churn 30 to 40 percent of the building every year so we're moving people in and moving people out? And um, so I'm happy to say over the last three years, we've actually averaged about a 40 percent churn rate in the building. Um, so if you do the math, you know, we've turned this building over at least uh, one and a half times. We make exceptions. We have a couple of companies that have been in here with us for a while, but there's you know reasons they're still here. But we're very proud of the stats. So we run at about 52 companies under this roof, anywhere between 150, 200 employees on uh, on a, a, a in a given time. Um, the stats: if you're in this building, you're going to raise two and a half times more capital than entrepreneurs in the region that are outside of the building. So there's just a lot of collisions, a lot of networking, um, a lot of serendipity that happens if you're in this facility. And of course, our team is here too. So it helps you interact with them. Even if you're here for a short period of time, you can access Wayne Embry's team, Ryan Helon's team, Christy Campbell's team, and, and get you know, innovation support, capital support, and marketing support to help you grow your business. We're very uh, also proud of the fact that um, we are affiliated with OSU, so our, our work with OSU helps us manage this facility. And roughly 30% of the facility now are spin-outs, either from OSU or Nationwide Children's, and I'll talk about that um, in a little more detail here in a moment. So central to us as humans and as professionals on the Rev1 team is inclusive entrepreneurship, and the, the topic of diversity. Um, we are in an incredibly diverse community. We're also in an industry that traditionally has not been terribly supportive of diverse teams. Um, in fact, in our industry, some of the best studies on you know, women-led high-growth uh, companies or minority-led high-growth companies, some of the first research was in 2015, and we're starting to see better uh, data every year. But what we know for a fact is that uh, diverse teams um, generate more successful companies. And um, so that's what we're all about here. And um, we, have, we have built a program that really um, breaks down any sort of selection bias on who's running the company. And we're very proud to say that our portfolio of investments, 30% um, plus of our founders are um, either minorities or women-led companies, and um, we, we see that uh, continuing to grow. We also have the same approach you know, in our management team and um, among our board. 
So if uh, you're going to build a, an engine to support startups, you're ultimately going to need to, to deploy capital. Um, so we are a region that uh, does not have a historically um, large base of resident venture capital. In fact, uh, when we raised our first fund in 2014, uh, part of the slide deck showed um, a comparison between Cincinnati, Cleveland, Indianapolis, and Pittsburgh, and then Columbus. Well, all, the, the previous cities I mentioned were economic powerhouses at the turn of the century. And so Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Cincy, Indy, they have a lot of old money in those towns, just a lot of old, old money. Columbus is a relatively new city when you think about it in comparison. And in fact, many of our large corporates that we're all very proud of in town still have the founders you know, e either leading uh, the efforts or the founders you know, are, are still living and, and part of the efforts. So that's a lot different when you look at um, some of our uh, sister cities in, in the Midwest. So the, the best days for us are ahead in all of that because we have a very wealthy community <coughs> and we're starting to make traction in our corporate base and um, individual angels beginning to, to write checks and form, form capital to, to help create these um, enterprises. So since 2014, we've actually raised roughly about $80 million of capital to deploy um, to startups in the region. Um, we launched uh, three new funds this year. One is called the Rev1 Fund, so it's a tw 20, roughly $25 million fund focused on seed and, and um, early stage investments. And in fact, the majority of the investors in that fund are our, our corporates in, in the region. And it was really the first ever fund at that stage to get so much corporate involvement here. So we hope that's one of many, and we hope that, that helps when a new VC comes to town that we helped open a door for them to, to go into some of those um, uh, companies and raise capital. So our corporate partners are really terrific. We have research institutions that are supporting the effort. And of course, the Ohio Third Frontier has been there um, all the way to help us uh, do the things that we're doing. So connecting the assets in the backyard. That's the, that's the real key of this effort. And so taking research institutions, corporates, um, successful advisors, service provider companies, so lawyers, accounting firms, marketing firms, engineering firms, banding them together to really help a community. And that's what we've, we've worked towards. And today, I think we have one of the uh, more connected communities um, for startups in the, in the country. Just our service provider network alone, is there's some 36 service providers in town um, who have provided, my ca how much have they provided in services? Uh, Two? 2.7 million. So, yeah, so we'll hit about 3 million probably this year, early next year. So that's discounted services onto the, the startups in the community. And it's more important than the, just the discounted services. It's getting those service providers connected to the startup community, knowing that that's a vibrant part of our economy, and them building their own internal practices around working with a startup. Because I raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. You're not the easiest bunch of people to work with, you know? So you, you sort of have to have a different, you know, path within a law firm or a marketing firm or something like that to work with a startup because you know one thing going in, they probably don't have money to pay for the services you're offering, you know? So how do I build this relationship and help this company start up and grow at the same time? So creating funds to start companies is, is one thing. And we've been very uh, diligent about that. And part of our model was we want to invest as, in as many bright companies as possible so we can raise the profile of Columbus in the country as a very vibrant startup and seed community. And I think we're, we're doing a great job uh, of doing that. But the real work comes in how do you help the companies grow? So it's one, it's one thing to do to, to help them start, but then how do we help them grow? And so the seed funding is very important. I'll show some stats here in a, in a moment on, on how we step from one stage to the next. But we've really built what we call wraparound services to help these companies grow. And we do this through a program called Learning Labs. Um, we have a series of learning labs around the five key business areas that we think are important. 
so to get a little bit tactical here for a moment, but you know, the product that the entrepreneur is building, the market that they're selling that product into, the business, can you make a business out of that product market combination, the team, can the, can the team that's on the, uh, at the table really drive this company forward to the next stage, and then the financial risk, you know, is this a financially feasible company? So we've built learning labs around all five of those core elements, and that makes us unique in, in our industry, and we band that together with all of our other services, and we consider ourselves a startup studio. So this is where you can come and find a whole breadth of services to help grow these companies. Much different than you know, accelerators or just traditional venture capitalists. We like to band services together over a long period of time to help these companies grow and, and be strong in our region. So I've talked a little bit about um, the R&D that is spent in our community on an annual basis, you know, roughly six billion or so. Tremendous opportunity for all of us. Um, and so core to our work has been how can we collaborate with uh, OSU, uh, Nationwide Children's, and Ohio Health in identifying um, technologies to spin out into our marketplace. Now OSU, we, we get to read about OSU in, in the paper a lot as it relates to commercialization. And since I've been here, there's been no fewer than uh, seven, uh, probably seven articles in the paper really profiling how poor OSU is at, at spin outs. Um, and to me, it's, when, you, when you research it, it's kind of an interesting conundrum because it wasn't until 2009 that the university, that it was legal for them to take equity in technologies that they spin out into to a marketplace. So in many ways, just our state laws around um, land grant institutions have put us uh, you know, three decades behind um, in other you know, regions of the country. But where we sit today is um, Rev1 has a strategic partnership with all three of these institutions. Um, we work with their commercialization professionals in a very collaborative way. We identify opportunities to spin out into the marketplace. We manage a, a source of capital that's specific to each one of those institutions so that we can be the first money that helps these um, companies spin out. So let's take OSU for, as an example. Um, they've ranked uh, last in the Big Ten in number of spin-outs for many, many years. The last two years, we've ranked roughly fifth, I think, in, in the Big Ten. Last year, we were ranked number one for the most momentum in number of startups with Northwestern. Um, Nationwide Children's uh, Research Institute, we launched a specific fund partnering with that institution this year. And um, we're working on six new spin-outs out of that institution um, just in 20, uh, tw what year are we in? 2017. Uh, similar activity ha happening at Ohio Health, all devoted on um, uh, enhancing and, and creating more doctor retention within the Ohio Health Network to support the innovations that they create internally there. So in the crystal ball, I, I see 10 years out, um, people are gonna look at Columbus as a very key um, successful commercialization community among R&D facilities in, in the U.S. Um, so we're just seeing more and more opportunities spinning out. So all of this encapsulate this in, into just a few impacts. Um, uh, our board has been very aggressive in setting um, goals for the work that we do for the community and we have a 2019 goal of providing a $2 billion impact back to the community. And the way you add that up is the startups, what kind of impact are they uh, making into the community in both the capital that they attract to the region and the revenues that their companies grow. And uh, today in our portfolio, we're just north of, I think we're at 1.4 billion. Uh, this chart's a little outdated. Um, so we're on pace to the $2 billion uh, goal. I have to raise your hand if you're a Rev1 board member. We're, I'm trying to reach that goal. I'm not sure we'll reach it, we're, but we're, we're darn close. Um, we have funded in excess of 70 companies over the last uh, handful of years. Uh, this year, we've already invested in 20 companies. We'll probably invest in, uh, Ryan, what do you think? 20, 25. 25. Ryan's always hedging. We'll probably invest about 27 companies this year. Uh, <laughs> 
And um, we've launched roughly about 80 million of, of, of funds um, uh, under management. Last year, um, our portfolio created or retained roughly about 1,000 jobs. So if you think about that in terms of a, a seed stage portfolio, that's pretty impressive. A couple of things we're very proud of is our portfolio is growing 100% year over year on, on revenue base. So these companies are growing and they're starting to scale, which is um, very important for our community. And I've mentioned the diversity uh, factor of uh, north of 30% in our portfolio. But if you think about the, the aspect of starting companies versus scaling, um, uh, this is a slide I like to point out. So 63% of our investments last year were follow-on investments. What that means is we had supported a number of companies the previous year that continued to grow and we were able to support them again. That's a very important stat for us because down below if you see Last year we made 11 concept stage investments, 11 seed investments, and five early stage investments. Each one of those is a progression in a company's growth. We're seeing the same thing this year. So we, we're seeing a very good population of companies growing from one stage to the next. And the degree at which we can continue to support those companies is an important factor for us because they stay stronger, they stay here in the region. And in the venture industry, 63% follow-on rate is, pre is pretty high. So a little bit about our team um, and, and our philosophy. Um, so all of the stats I've talked about, the 80 million of capital that has um, gone into play, I know my team is laughing at my legs here, I see you guys over there. Um, all the resources that help this facility, all the resources that fund the team and myself, all of those resources come from the community. Either come from the state through the Third Frontier Program, they come from our 50, uh, almost 50 corporate partners, or they come from our community partners, the City of Columbus, Franklin County, uh, the City of Dublin, Grove City, um, New Albany. So we have this philosophy when we're working with a startup is that, look, all the money is coming from the community to support you as you become successful we need you to have a philosophy to give back into the community. We created a, a giving fund last year we call the START Fund that is um, actually administered by uh, some of our uh, successful startup CEOs. And it's designed, they all give to the fund. Uh, Rev1 gives to it as well. And it's designed to give to philanthropic endeavors that are starting up into the community. So that's, that's one way we're, we're launching that. We're always accepting donations to that fund. We want that to be one of the largest uh, entrepreneur giving funds um, in, in, the, uh, in the country, so we'd love for all of you to give back. But we give back as well, so um, our team uh, just, what, about a month, three, three weeks ago, um, donated a, 100 hours at uh, Franklinton Gardens. If you've not been to Franklinton Gardens, it's a terrific community garden that, that grows and provides food for the community of Franklinton. Um, we, we dug uh, post holes that day. So uh, where we stand today, Rev1 Ventures has been ranked uh, the, the number one most active venture fund in the Great Lakes for three years running now, something we're very proud of. Um, and another thing to be proud of on that list of, um, of the top 10 the number on the left shows you how many investments that each one of these funds made during, during the 2015-2017 era. But you have Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus all within the top 10. Uh, Third Frontier deserves a lot of credit. None of us would have sort of the, the Third Frontier provide the catalyst money for all of us to start our venture funds. But you're starting to see Ohio really become prominent in, in the startup world. And then our community was ranked the number one city for scaling startups by the Kauffman Foundation last year. For us, that is a very important stat for our community because that means we're not just starting companies here. These companies are growing. They're beginning to scale. You know, we just had our first billion dollar exit uh, this past year. Um, and you know, that, those kinds of things put a spotlight on a community. So hopefully that's the first big exit of, of many to come. So I'm going to pause on this chart for a moment. This is an eye chart, but we, we really wanted to show 
our view of sort of the state of the, of the Columbus startup community. And this isn't all inclusive. Uh, there, there are other initiatives out there, some that are being formed today that we haven't made to this list. But this is becoming a very vibrant ecosystem. So if you start at the top, we have local media that is very engaged in writing stories about the, the startups. And you really need that. Um, and those stories are getting picked up nationally. We have some very impressive, what you call tent pole companies, companies that are beginning to scale and um, have a number of uh, successes in raising a lot of venture capital and growing jobs. We have a very active university and research, um, research base. All of the institutions I show there in the bottom right are deeply engaged in the innovation economy here in central Ohio. Local government, so I mentioned City of Columbus, Dublin, Grove City, Franklin County, uh, you know, then Columbus 2020, uh, the state at the Ohio Third Frontier and DSA level, a lot of emphasis and support for what our uh, entrepreneurs are doing in the region. The investment base is growing. H had we built this slide five years ago, there'd probably be two logos there. So just think about the growth in five years. Um, and there's a new fund in the room and their logo isn't on here, so I just got busted. So there's one more that, that needs to be on here as well. Uh, shout out to Tamron Hill. So. Um, but you need this. And you'll hear, you're, you'll hear people say that there is a capital gap in this region. And even with all of these funds, there is still a tremendous capital gap. The biggest challenge is the two to five million uh, raise for an entrepreneur. We do pretty good up to about two million, and then when you need two to five million, that's, that becomes much more difficult. There are a lot of startup support organizations, some grassroots, some funded by um, the city, some funded by you know, regional partners. Uh, there are now uh, three accelerators um, in our region. Um, you have uh, things like the Idea Foundry. I mean, there's just a lot of new initiatives that are starting. And just this year, we've had, what, the two, two brand new accelerators just this year. And then finally, um, but, but not least, are the, the corporate base. The corporate base is getting more and more engaged in the innovation uh, sector and in startups. Um, in fact, with us today, we have uh, Kim Garland from State Auto Labs, which is a brand new uh, innovation arm of State Auto. We've read about Nationwide's innovation arm. We all know what's happening at Cardinal Health. There's just a lot of um, synergistic work going on between uh, corporate base and the startups that are really um, helping our community thrive. And important for me to end on this slide because we really couldn't do what we do without our corporate partners in the Ohio Third Frontier. So it's a very exciting time to be here. There's been a lot of growth in, um, in a very short period of time. Um, maybe I'll end, leave that up. Um, a lot of growth. Um, for us, let's see, our startups, we have, um, we've closed 20 rounds this year, or invested in 20 companies. The first two quarters of this year, in terms of attracting venture capital to our portfolio companies, was a record. In fact, the majority of the venture capital raised um, in that period of time came into uh, Columbus in, in companies that were in our portfolio. So that's one of the first times that, that has ever happened. There's still a lot of work uh, to do. If you compare the amount of venture capital that's invested in our um, community compared to say like a, uh, a city uh, uh, like Picks Pittsburgh. Pardon me, had a hard, hard time getting that out. <laughs> um, there's more venture capital invested in the city of Pittsburgh every year than, than almost the entire state of Ohio. It's not, not quite right, but it's darn close. Just imagine that. So that's a, a city about our same size and it's only three hours away. So there's still a lot of work to do and the competitive infrastructure to make sure we have the kinds of um, resources to help companies grow here. Um, but it is an exciting time. So you've been very patient in listening to me. So how about we throw it to the audience for some questions? Surely there's Mr. Cotty. I'm sorry, Mr. Cotty. We'll, um, we have the microphone right here. We'll come right to you. Yes, sir. Hi, Tom. So you kind of mentioned that there were a number of 
reports about OSU being very bad at capitalizing anything because of state laws related to some, something to do with state laws. So what has changed in the state laws that now allow entrepreneurs here in Ohio uh, to actually be like the rest of the country? I mean, you mentioned one thing about Ohio being allowed, Ohio State being allowed to take equity in a company. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I can't imagine that was sort of the major problem because as I recall reading these articles, Ohio University did extremely well in comparison to the giant that we have and mm -hmm. enormous funding from NIH, yet very little of that ever made it into commercialization. So from your perspective, I don't know, do you know what all Sure, it's, it's a good question. There's not there's not one single answer to that question, but here's a few points. So in 2009, um, the amendment to the state constitution was made to allow uh, the university to take equity in spin-outs. So companies that, that spin out based on technology generated at the university. So that was a fundamental change that had to happen um, just so that business mechanic, uh, uh, mechanics could go into place, right? Then the other thing that you've seen is in, it, um, in the last uh, five, six years, a, a very intense focus on creating a commercialization um, environment at the university. And some of that involves a long-term project of changing culture among faculty and, and, and even administration in you know, putting the spotlight on the importance of, of startups. Then there's also been the increase in um, the amount of capital and resources available to help spin these opportunities out. You know, it's one thing to identify a technology that looks like it has a good market potential and to even find the capital to start the company around it, but it's another thing to get the kinds of capital to help the company start growing and continue to develop that, techno uh, that technology. So we're really just now getting to a place where at, in, at a, just a modicum of scale that we can get enough capital into, into some of the commercialization entities. So I still think that we're in the, we're in the ground floor. There's been a, a, an amazing amount of progress, but we're still in the ground floor in terms of having that robust infrastructure that can uh, spin these opportunities out in a, in a very routine manner. It's a great question. Mr. Cotty, sorry to put you on ice there. No problem. Uh, it's, as you know, I've uh, had companies and have been part of companies since uh, 2005, and I really appreciate the team you put together and the kind of programs you have to support. Uh, I only have one question, I guess, and it's, it's an, always an easy one to answer. You've talked about all the things that have come along and are working. What's not working? What needs to be changed? What needs to be changed? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, nothing is perfect in this environment, I can, I can assure you of that. Um, there's a list of things we're working on. There, there's still a, a cultural divide um, in, in our region um, regarding what it takes to really start um, these high growth businesses. This is a risky endeavor. So think about the success we've had in, in raising capital and deploying capital. Well, these are long-term investments. You know, these funds are 10 to 12 years. So, um, you know, we're raising money just to pick on us for a moment from corporates and telling them, you know, we'll let you know the results uh, uh, in a decade. You know, that's a tough sell, right? And especially in in um, a fairly conservative, you know, part of the country. But it is getting a lot better, and and getting more people under the tent, which has been part of our strategy. It helps with that cultural change. Um, uh, capital attraction is just darn hard. You know, we, last year, I think the stat is, and Ryan can correct me, but I think our portfolio companies raised capital from 22 different states. So um, that is still a big challenge. And so as, our, as we're very proud of our seed portfolio and the way they're scaling, uh, we don't know where that next round of capital is going to come from for them, and nor do they. And so, you know, that, that is a challenge. Um, uh, I could keep going. I'll add one more, and you know, because th there is a, a list, a laundry list that we think about every day. Our infrastructure is behind the times um, in, in Columbus uh, to support certain kinds of companies that, that are really indigenous to, to sort of the population. And so, 
if you think about the, the number of companies that are being created on really hardcore IP coming out of a resource institution that, uh, or something of that nature, um, our web labs in, in this city are, are behind the times. Um, and we think about some of our competitive cities who have you know, invested in that kind of infrastructure. So I think that that's an important step that we have to overcome. You know, it's sort of like making sure you have the right Wi-Fi in a region anymore. You, know, you, you need to also have the right kind of infrastructure to help, help some of these um, opportunities flourish. And we're a little bit behind there. Next question. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, sir. So the different groups in Columbus seem to work together better than they do maybe in other places I've been. What causes that? that, that is a, that's a fascinating question. You know, I've been in several um, uh, communities. Um, and I, I've even done this work in, in Europe, in the UK. And each community has its own vibe, you know, and, and each community has its, uh, um, what I call its passion streams, and each community has its negative, uh, negative Nellies, you know, and, and, and they all do, and, and ours does. But there is something different about Columbus that um, makes us much more collaborative. I mean, it, I think back to the story I started off with today when I was recruited here, it was uh, six or seven uh, re CEOs of big companies here who weren't involved in the startup community but knew we needed it and wanted to collaborate to do it, right? And, and um, you know, you can still get a meeting with just about any executive in town. Um, and even the startup ecosystem, we all believe that our best days are ahead of us. It's a very aspiring community. And you see that throughout. So, um, uh, there, you know, the, so there's something about the personality of the population base here. I think it helps that um, we're in a region that uh, the economy stays pretty strong. You know, when others have big dips, we don't dip as far. Um, so there's always resources to continue, continue to try and do new things, and I, I think that helps with the with a thoughtful and strategic and innovative, you know, culture. What do you think? You've been here a couple of years. It feels very different, right? Yeah. Um, when, when at least I talk to folks, they think about what they need to accomplish, but they also think about how it can help Columbus, and I mm -hmm. don't see that in other places, yeah. and I'm just, I don't know if it's something in the water. I, I don't know what causes that, but there's some version of magic here is my sense. You know, that, that is very much, you know, when we raised our Rev1 fund, it was, um, the pitch ended up being a dual pitch. It was, it's a return on investment fund, but how is it going to help the region? You know, all of our investors wanted us to answer those questions. Next question. Surely there's a, yes, sir. Um, what does success look like? Yeah, so um, I'm going to answer that from the Columbus perspective, not so much Rev1, because if, if this comes true, you know, we will have all been success. But um, we need more exits. And so those of you that don't know what an exit is, let me explain that. So all of us have been putting resources and capital in these companies. Eventually, that capital has to come back. And... Um, the um, Cover My Meds exit that we all read about a few months ago, the first billion dollar exit of a company in Columbus, what an enormous story that is. And having been in um, other communities that have had sizable exits like that, the, the, the way that changes the, the dynamics in the community is, um, is significant. You, you end up creating more angel investors. So, People that owned equity in those companies in the early days are now millionaires. Um, those millionaires start reinvesting in the community. Some of them create new restaurants. Some of them might create new condo developments. Some of them might create new companies. And so as you get more of those kinds of success stories, it changes the, the, the makeup of a community in, in a really dramatic way. Um, if you want to learn more about that, 
uh, Google Bozeman, Montana tonight. Small town, 40,000 people, uh, two years ago, three years ago, had a billion dollar tech exit. And you can just see in a really small environment how that has dramatically changed you know, a, a small town. But we need more of those kinds of success stories um, to, to really uh, start feeling like you know, this, this, this ship is heading in the, in the right direction. Any other questions? Going, going. Well, you've been very attentive. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, in, in the, in the so the question is, you know, what are some of the talent gaps in the region? Well, there's a talent war in the U, in the U.S. right now. Everybody is is searching for different talent. Um, for us, um, and I'll ask some of my colleagues to to chime in on this too, but. Um, we see gaps at sort of all skill levels in, in software um, development. You know, you, you sort of have the hard coder talent that is, um, there's just not enough in town. That's why we've been very supportive of groups like IC Stars and Tech Elevator, you know, training up sort of that, that front end um, army of coders. Uh, but then you have it all, you have that gap at the senior level too. So. You know, we're creating these companies with innovative technologies, oftentimes with first-time entrepreneurs, but where's that senior talent that's done it before and knows how to navigate, you know, the alligator-infested waters of the marketplace and those kinds of things? And we're, we, you know, we need more senior executive talent at the CEO level, at the CTO level, at, you know, you see, see whatever. Um, so to, to me, those are some of the key talent gaps. Um, and we, we also don't have enough investors. Um, we don't have enough professional investors in town who have uh, actually gone through the cycle of raising capital, investing capital into companies, and harvesting those investments and doing it all over again. You know? So um, that's a, a vibrant part of the ecosystem that's missing as well. Hey, Tom, Tina. how do you engage CEOs that have had great exits but have not um, become more engaged in the angel community. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? I can. Uh, Tina asked the question, how do you engage uh, successful CEOs or exited founders who have not started giving back or re-engaged in the angel community? And that's a tough question, you know. Um, Last night we had Marianne Hudson from the Angel Capital Association at the Venture Ohio dinner and she was giving some really interesting stats on the growth of women angels in the country and, and their role in giving back. There has been a tremendous amount of growth in the angel community across the country over the last 15 years or so and we've certainly seen that here. Um, the Ohio Tech Angel Fund is one of the largest angel funds in the country um, but if you look at our transition from one fund to the next, you get about a 50% drop off. In other words, 50% new members and then 50% drop off. So it's always this game of trying to keep uh, angels engaged in the process. Um, I think it's difficult because it is a long investment cycle and you're investing your own money and these are, you know, 10 year holds. So you hope to get a crop of successful entrepreneurs in their 40s and 50s, you know, because, um, you know, if, if, uh, if you start your angel investing when you're 75, um, you know, you may not live to see your, your best exits, right? So um, there are some things we're doing. Um, we've launched a boomerang effort. Who's, who's on the team in the room that's launched the boomerang? Heather, are, are you... Laura, Laura, come on in the room. While Laura's coming up, we'll talk about our boomerang effort. We think part of it is reaching out. You know, we do have one of the largest alumni networks in the country here. So how do we reach out and get those successful people to get them back involved? Some of it is exposing them to these opportunities. We have that same problem with minorities. How do we get more women and um, minorities who have been very successful into the angel world? Because if you've not made angel investments, you, you know, you don't, you don't quite know that it's even a, a, an asset class. Laura, can you share with us the boomerang effort? Yeah, sure. Um, so we are, I'm actually a boomeranger myself. So boomeranger basically means 
You have a tie to Central Ohio. You went to high school or college here, grew up here, but have since left the region and have started your career elsewhere. So um, after college, I moved to DC and then moved back here about two and a half years ago. Um, so right now, we're actually trying to organize a happy hour event to identify really, re really talented boomerangers from across the country who we can attract back here on Thursday, December 21st, if anyone can come or knows somebody who can come, um, to really show them the incredible entrepreneurial landscape we have in Columbus. So not only connecting them with potential job opportunities, but just showing them everything that's going on here. Because I think um, Columbus is starting to get more and more national media attention, but I still think there's a gap there where people just don't understand the, the landscape that's been built here. So that's a little bit of what we're working on. So part of it is awareness. And so even when there's new funds being created, regardless of who's raising the fund, how do we introduce folks to those opportunities to start getting exposed? Um, I think there's a comment. Mark, you have a comment? Okay, man. Yeah. Answer. I think one of the problems historically has been, having been around here long enough and seen other people go through the cycle, is most of the entrepreneurs in the past that have succeeded around here knew how hard it was. And so what we're doing more broadly is a large part of the answer because they're smart people and they're like, this, this was, a, it was, it was a bear. So mm -hmm. they don't come back. Now, now that I think we're providing an environment where it's getting simpler, and more straightforward, you'll just naturally see it happen. I think you will. We had um, Pete Kite uh, present here a couple of months ago. I don't know the, those of you know that name, but Pete is probably uh, the most successful fintech entrepreneur that the state of Ohio has ever produced. Uh, he started Check Free um, in a basement in uh, Worthington, I think, and, um, but ended up in Atlanta because of the whole capital thing. But you know, you see him, he's starting to come and give back to this community. And there's part of that too, some of them left. You know, some of them left, some of the more successful entrepreneurs. How about one more question? Close out on one more. Susan, please. As a board member, we spend a lot of time talking about the future. And so you mentioned Third Frontier and how instrumental that bond funding was to get Rev1 going, maybe share with this audience what you think the future holds as potentially that those state funds are not available. That's, a, that's an excellent question. We, you know, we don't know the answer to the future of Third Frontier. Um, there's still a lot of capital in that program, pardon me, in that program. Um, and a lot of that is driven by the administration. So the current administration is trying to set this program up for an easy transition to the next administration that, um, when we have a new governor. And that will, when that uh, individual is identified and in office, we'll know a lot more about the future of the Third Frontier program. But maybe I'll speak to it on how Rev1 and our board has really um, been challenging us uh, since day one. And that is, you know, we wanted to build Rev1 um, in a manner where we could use the state funds as a catalyst for us to grow all of these other partnerships in the private sector so that we don't become too dependent on the state. And um, we've done an excellent job of that. Uh, the, the, the state is a much smaller portion of our revenue stream than, uh, say, the private sector. And we've, um, I, I shared a lot about the commercialization work uh, with uh, research institutions. Well, we began doing that for the corporate base, too, about three years ago. And that work has been evolving. And the same process that we use to um, help startups assess their technologies is the same process that corporates do in their own innovation process. So, you know, we see some of those opportunities continuing to grow and strengthen the foundation of, of what we're doing here in the community. Um, I'm an optimist as it relates to state funding. Ohio has been uh, one of the leaders um, uh, since the early 80s, it was the first state that had a statewide incubator program. So they've really been a leader in supporting startups for a long, long time. And I, I believe the state will continue to support uh, these kinds of initiatives at some level. We just don't know what level and then under what mechanism and you know those kinds of things. But there are some huge gaps um, that really only a state can, can help us fill. Uh, one is how do you address the capital gap? Uh, the state's done a great job through Third Frontier in helping create the angel funds and the seed programs and, and some of those things that are throughout the state. Uh, but we no longer have a fund-to-funds program. And 
Um, state uh, to our east, Pennsylvania, highly competitive state for us in terms of the startup world. They have a very successful fund to fund program. Michigan has a very successful fund to fund program. What those programs do is they help establish new venture funds in your state. So that's an opportunity, I think, for the next administration um, and other things related to closing the capital gap that could be big initiatives for a future administration. And we have one more question. The networking that you've done regionally, how has that helped you in determining how you move forward with Revlon? What have you learned and what, what um, opportunities is that bringing us here locally? That's a, actually an excellent question to end on. So the question is, the networking that we've done over the years, how has that influenced our strategy and design for Rev1 in the future and how might that impact the community, I think is the question. Well, I mean, though the networking we've done with our partners um, has been very influential in our strategy moving forward because that, you know, it allows you to learn um, what are the aspirations and the goals of your partners in terms of where they would like to see the community go. Um, the growth and in innovation um, through our research institutions and through our corporate base, you know, I, I pointed to, to one corporate innovator here uh, with us today. That's going to continue to grow in this community. I think Columbus will um, over time become known as one of the most innovative communities in, in the country. Um, and I think that, you know, we're going to play a central role in that. We already do. Um, now, we're niche in our role and, and we stay very focused and our, our focus on all of that is how do we link the startup work towards corporate innovation to continue to help drive that part of the, the economy. But as, as the corporate base in our region is, they're older companies now and they need to innovate. As if we can stay on the forefront of that with our startup portfolios, I think it's going to really create a vibrant ecosystem here. You've been a terrific audience. You've been much more quiet. It must have been the Piata that brought you all in here. But uh, it's been a real pleasure. And um, I really enjoy talking about Rev1. And I enjoy seeing all of the friends and partners out here in the audience. And I thank you very much for your time.